All right. So we've been going through the book of Romans and studying through that. And today was supposed to be continuing on through that discussion. And we were in Romans chapter 9. And I was looking at doing uh, the rest of Romans 9 and all of Romans 10 as part of this message and was going through and studying it. And as I did that, I kind of... Um, was pushed in a little bit different direction. And we're still doing the book of Romans, but I'm not going to go through all that section today, even though that is kind of connected. And in order to understand any of it, you kind of have to look at the whole thought process of the apostle as he's writing this letter. But I am not going to do that. I wanted to do, uh, it's been a few weeks, and wanted to do a, a touch of a reminder uh, going back into what we've talked about before. In Romans chapter 9, verses 6 through 26, we went through and kind of looked at a lot of information there. And I did an illustration of, I brought two uh, pieces of pottery. Does anybody remember that? Or some of you that were here. And I had a cup that I had made and a cup that a friend of ours had made that we, she was uh, one who did pottery. And so we were at her house doing the pottery, and that's where we got the chance to make uh, the pottery I did. And mine had, you know, and it, she laid out and made these amazing, like, uh, sheets of clay that were about a mm, quarter inch thick. And that was what we were using to do whatever we wanted to do with. And so she gave one to each of us in the family and for an afternoon. And we were all doing this at one time when we were over at her house. And... I'm like, hey, I'm going to make a mug because, you know, I'm a coffee drinker. And so a giant coffee mug is an awesome thing. So I folded mine up like this into a, into a cylinder. And, and so you get the cylinder. Now, the thing with clay and making pottery is you have to make sure that all the seams are not there. Okay, so I put it together and I'm like, okay, now what do I do? So then I'm starting to like use my fingers to pinch all the seams together and then I had to make a bottom and so I cut out a bottom for the right size and stuck it there well that needed to be seamed together so I'm hitting there pinching and if you remember that cup those of you that I don't know if everybody was here but it kind of went like this at the bottom because of where I had to pinch everything and you could see my if you look closely you could see my thumbprints and fingerprints you know around that whole thing and all the way up and down. And I like to say that it's just nice and rustic, right? You know, it has that raw, rustic coolness about it. But probably most people say I'm a terrible potter. <laughs> and that, that piece of pottery definitely looked like one that an amateur made, you know, someone that is doing it for the first time. Now hers, if you remember correctly, and I, it was like perfect round, and it had this beautiful sculptured aspect to it, and the handle that was on it was like flawless and fit perfectly on it, and it had the thumb spot on the top of it for you to drink like this, and, and it had these beautiful colorations in it from the different types of clay that she used, and no seams, no thumbprints, no nothing like that were found in this piece of pottery. And of course, I was using it as an illustration because the Apostle Paul likens back to a story or a, a illustration in the t Old Testament, the Tanakh, that, and he uses it for himself saying that our great God has the ability, to, does he not, as creator of everything, to take one out of the same lump of clay, split it in two, and out of one make a vessel that's going to be used only for like getting water, you know, maybe collecting icky things like garbage or manure or things like that or maybe it's just a um, pot that's just going to sit up there and all it's going to ever have in it is is flour you know and have a lid on it and that's all it ever does where this other one has the ability to sit there and be made into something really beautiful and fine and, and it's got gorgeous curves and the colorations and maybe it's going to be sent onto a artist who's going to make these beautiful paintings on the outside it's going to be fired it's going to shine and it's going to sit on a pedestal where everybody can go ooh and ah about it. And maybe like a mean vase today that's worth like what, three, four, five million dollars. You know, it'll be a three, four, five million dollar vase. And it's, I, the, the thought process the Apostle Paul is going through is that 
our creator has that right and that privilege as the creator to take one thing and make it a vessel for common ordinary use and make another vessel for beauty and great things. So we look at Romans chapter 9 verses 21 through 24 is that actual part that he says. He says, does not the potter have power over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor? What if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had prepared beforehand for glory? Even us, whom he called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles, of the nations. Paul then pulls several scriptures together to validate what he already has stated in verses 1 through 24. And what he will continue to share under the leading of the Holy Spirit in the rest of chapters 9 through 11. So we continue to see Paul's discussion of Jehovah's authority, his righteousness, and his faithfulness in dealing with Israel and the rest of the nations. So look with me at 25 through 29 as he quotes these different scripture passages. And he says also in Hosea, I will call them by people who were not my people, and her beloved who was not beloved. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people, there they shall be called sons of the living God. Isaiah also cries out concerning Israel, Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, the remnant will be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because Jehovah will make a short work upon the earth. And as Isaiah said before, unless Jehovah Tsevaot, Jehovah of hosts, or Jehovah of armies, had left us a seed, we would have become like Sodom, and we would have been made like Gomorrah. Now, you may remember what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> is there anything left of those two? Oh, is there anything left of those two? Ash? No. There's nothing left of the well. I mean, you can go there. Yeah, there's ash left. And according to a lot of modern day archaeologists, historic, historical guys, you can go there and actually see the sulfur and the ash that's built up and see the city of Sodom and Gomorrah still left there. It doesn't look like a city, though. It just looks like dirt and ash and sulfur bits left in there. So here we see in the scripture quoted, or paraphrase, things from Isaiah, Hosea, similar um, phrases and understanding from Psalms, Ezra, Micah, and Jeremiah are also present in these passages that are quoted here. Chapters 9 through 11 of Romans that we're going to be looking through ultimately answer a question raised in the minds of the disciples from the nations as compared to the Jewish disciples. A question from the was it, rose in the mind of those disciples who were from the nations, the Gentiles, those who were from a pagan origin, versus the disciples who were Jews. The question that is asked is, if Jehovah, as powerful and faithful as you state he is in Romans chapter 8, if this is true, then why, as more and more pagans from the nations accept the message of the good news, are more and more Jews rejecting and opposing it? Let me say that again. If Jehovah is as powerful and faithful as Paul, as you state he is in Romans chapter 8, which is this amazing passage of scripture, it talks about the glory of God and what he has done for us, and how he protects us and cares for us and loves us, and, 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 and nothing can take him out of our, his hands, etc., etc. If God is that powerful and faithful, then why, as more and more pagans accept the message of the good news, are more and more Jews rejecting and opposing it. 
Didn't God say repeatedly in the Tanakh how much he loves Israel, even with an everlasting love? David Stern, in his commentary, writes, If God's love for the Jews is everlasting, how can it be that despite centuries of experience with God himself, and despite having God's word with its messianic promises, so many of the Jews individually and the Jewish nation as an entity are refusing this love as expressed through his Messiah. Apparently, they, with all their advantages that we talked about, remember in verses 1 through 6 there, 1 through 5, all its advantages are being lost, and God's everlasting love won't do them any good. That worries us, says the Gentile believers. How can we be sure of your promise that no created thing will separate us from the love of God if he cannot do that for the Jews themselves. Because of the believer, Jew or Gentile, seeing the rejection of the Messiah by most Jewish people and questioning the trustworthiness of Jehovah from Paul's letter to this point, Paul writes a whole interlude right here to his letter tackling the Jewish question very personally and very thoroughly. This little interlude here is something that seems quite a, kind of confusing if you take it out of the context of the whole of the book of Romans. And if you take it out of the context of the Apostle Paul striving to answer these questions from these Roman believers. Ultimately, the question is, is the creator of the universe a sadistic God who claims one thing but either does another or can't fulfill his own promises? That's the question that is being answered in this section and in this passage. Because let's face it, did not the children of Israel be given by God the Torah, the commandments, the covenants? And they said, if you do these things, then you will be blessed beyond all measure. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Bill? Can everybody else say amen? Amen. Okay. It's in the scripture. If you don't, if you don't know that to be true, then look it up, and and I'll, we'll go and look it up together afterwards. But it is in there. This is what has happened. Yet, for two thousand years, what do we see in the entirety of the Tanakh? We see time after time after time that the children of Israel refuse to do what God says and are punished and beaten down and crushed and taken over and exiled, and the land becomes nothing and void. And that has been, and then it comes back to. They come back to the land, right? And then all the messianic prom promises happen. Yeshua returns to the land, and he goes and lives his life, and we call that around 1, 1 AD, you know, the, the new Anno Domini after, after God. Is that right? The year, uh, the year of our Lord. Thank you. Anno Domini. Anno, I forgot. BC, you know, before Christ, but that kind of thing. So we use that as a marker as his Messiah is this time frame. And his, his life and his ministry on the earth. And then the disciples and the rest of the what we call the New Testament, the apostolic writings and scriptures. Right? And then at the end of all that time, what happens? Israel's destroyed. They're kicked out of the land again. The temple's destroyed. And within 135 years, the city of Jerusalem is no longer called Jerusalem. It's called Anatolia Capitolonia, I think. Forgive me if I screwed that up. I did, I think. But basically, it's the capital of Antonius, the Caesar, in Rome, if I'm not mistaken, at the time. And there are no Jews allowed to live in it anymore. They are exiled completely, and if they are found there, they will be executed by the Roman Empire. That does not sound like a god who's claimed and fulfilled his promises to a people through 25, 2,000, 2,100 years before, does it? And that's what these believers are going through and thinking in their mind as they're seeing this picture happening, this history happening before their eyes. And they are right there at the pinnacle of this time frame where they are in this whole, the mix of this stuff. 
And so, let's face it, they're mixing and gathering with fellow Jewish believers in the city of Rome, the capital of all this stuff that's going on. And it looks to them, as the Apostle Paul is sharing in this letter, and probably they were thinking beforehand and wrote him some questions, is God capable of protecting us if he can't protect the Israelites? So Paul responds with a detailed outline to counteract this concern of the believers he is writing to. In verses 1 through 5, he explains that by rejecting the gospel, Israel, with their many advantages, makes it appear that Jehovah's promises have failed. In verses 6 through 29, he puts forward the question on the minds of the Roman believers and its answer. Is Jehovah the God of the universe and of Israel to blame for all this mess? And the answer is absolutely not. In verse 30 through Romans 10, verse 21, the question is, is Israel to blame? And the answer is absolutely yes. And then Romans 11 concludes with the result. Israel's failure is not permanent. Yehovah hasn't rejected his people and will fulfill his promises to them. The resulting fulfillment will be a way more amazing and tremendous thing than what was originally thought as the plan. And you think about, like my wife was saying, we wanted to go to, to France, and we wanted to be able to help the French people and tell them about Yeshua, and hopefully they would uh, come to knowledge of faith in Yeshua and grow up to have godly lives in that land. And God shut that door on us and led us in a lot of different bunny trails around and over the hills and through the woods and et cetera, et cetera, until this point where maybe he wanted us to grow and do a whole lot of different things to learn and then someone else is going to come alongside and take the word of God to those people. There is no way we could have thought of that one 20 years ago. 20, 24 years ago now? Yeah, 24 years ago. No way. Israel's stumbling has resulted in the means of salvation coming to the rest of the nations, the Gentiles, allowing all Israel to be saved. And as a result, the Gentiles who were not my people should show Jehovah's kindness and mercy to the Jews because it is through this mercy that salvation shall come to the Jewish people. That is a quick synopsis of the Apostle Paul's discussion here in Romans 9-11 through 11, and we'll be going and Unpacking that in the next several weeks as we go through the sections. I was going to do a lot more than as I said I was going to today, but I kind of was stopped short in Romans chapter 9 and verse 30. And there it says, What shall we say then? The Gentiles who do not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith. Gentiles. If you are not a person who grew up in the church, reading your Bible, do you have any clue what that word means? No. Maybe even if you grow up in the church and read your Bible, you might still not really understand what that word means. And I think Jeremy went back there because he has a perfect example of an individual who did not grow up in the Bible and in church for his early life and that obviously had no clue probably about what Gentiles were. So reading that, if you're reading all this stuff about Gentiles here and Gentiles there, it's like right over your head, right? Have you ever read something before and not understand the vocabulary that's being used? Do you understand what's going on? No. I've been there. How many of you uh, watched the thing last night with us, the Ron Rude Waking? Okay, good. Did any of you download there? I guess there was a, a, uh, a quiz that was part of it. 
I, I didn't know anything about this, but supposedly there's a quiz. Is we de and downloaded it and printed it off. We started looking at it. We're like, what is this asking? <laughs> They use all these big words in there, and we were chuckling to ourselves, going like, is anybody going to be able to answer any of these questions from what we'd said? I don't know. Because there was all these big words, the whole meaning of the questions was kind of obscure, unless you really understood what those words were all asking about. They used a lot of big words. Rule number one, know your audience when you're writing something and write to that audience. <laughs> I guess they thought we were a bunch of biblical scholars that they're listening there, so all of you got it, right? <laughs> but Gentiles, I mean, that's a word that is throughout the New Testament. What are Gentiles? Well, simply put, those are, in essence, non-Jews. People who were not connected by blood to Abraham. Does that make it pretty clear? Shall we say, former pagans. Because the context here are these people had no context or understanding of the Bible. So these people in, in Rome and Galatia and Corinth, they had no knowledge of God. Athens, or even sometimes in, in, in Israel itself. Um, you said non-Jews, you mean non-Israelites? Yes. Huh? Was it only people that weren't connected to Abraham? I mean, it, by blood. Include, well, well I see. So you're saying like down the road, Jacob instead of necessarily Abraham, because then you'd have I, um, Ishmaelites and and uh, yeah. uh, the sons of Keturah and all. It's very good. Yes. I'm also talking about even his first son. Ishmael. Ishmael. Yeah. Yes. So all those, those are not included. Yes. Thank you for the connection there. And the, the, yes, that's a good, a good question to ask at that point. So yes, Gentiles are those, I guess, who are of the blood of Jacob and his sons, and therefore of the tribes, the 12 tribes of Israel that could somewhat declare their lineage somewhere down the road from those original 12 sons of Jacob. Thank you for that. That's a great question. Um, Clarification, yes, that's the word I was trying to think of. So, not those Gentiles are all those people that had no connection to Israel and its history. They had no connection to the covenants of promise. They had no connection to any of these things. They were pagans. Now, I don't know how many people here grew up not in a church and not growing up in a home that cared about God and probably didn't have a Bible in the house or anything. It, it, I, I, Jeremy kind of is about, I know him, and we know his story, but anybody else? So Okay, so we're pretty similar here in our, our background. So we have a little bit of knowledge about the Bible, at least, if not more. So we really can't say we're, we understand when I say former pagans what I'm actually meaning. Because the people who were Gentiles that were coming into the faith and knowledge of Yeshua through the apostles' teaching and witnessing of others, they had no clue who this guy was. They had no clue about the Messianic prophecies. They had no clue about what it meant to have the Ten Commandments. They had no idea what who Yehovah was or his son Yeshua or a Messiah. They, those were all foreign concepts to these people. So you can imagine as Paul and Peter and Silas and Barnabas and James and, well, not necessarily James, because James, they probably stayed in Israel itself. But the other apostles, Timothy, Titus, so on and so forth, as they went around, they had to start from square zero when they're teaching these people. You know, it'd be like teaching an infant about how to say the alphabet. They don't know the alphabet, do they? So you can't go right in and say, hey, by the way, can you read this? And give them a book and say, come on, read. Because they don't know that. They don't understand what is being put before them. And so these apostles had to go back to square one and take, teach little itty baby steps. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul, writing to Ephesus in verses 11 and 12, says this, this to them. He says, Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, 
as comparison to the Jews or Israelites in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, pagans, by those, by what is called circumcision, the Jews, made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Messiah, the good news, the gospel, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That says it pretty simply where they were at, doesn't it? No knowledge of the things that we all grew up with. Romans chapter 1, going back into Romans and verses 18 through 32, to refresh our mind on this, Excuse me. Paul goes on and says this about it. See if you could see our world and our country in these passages of Scripture. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest to them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful. But because, but became futile, excuse me, in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. So they lost they literally pulled back from the knowledge of the truth of the Word of God and basically said, I'm not going to see. I, I refuse to look at what's around me. I'm going to close my eyes and put my hands over my eyes. And, and if, do you know that like, if you're stuck in a cave for a long enough time with no light, that you almost become blind? Because you, know, you, you lose your senses because you're not using them? It's kind of the idea of what's going on in the world. Because mankind has re purposely refused to see the truth of God and has closed his eyes and covered his eyes so he doesn't have any light coming into them so that he does not have any understanding of the word of, of God and his word. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator." who is blessed forever. Amen. So, think about this. My Facebook feed the last several days, going through and they throw up ads into my Facebook feed. You may have that happen. And you have like, what do you want is on your mind and all of a sudden 50,000 ads. And oh, by the way, there I can get to somebody's yeah, actual yeah. legitimate yeah. statement in there. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just tell you though, I go on, I've been going on the Facebook about once, a month for the last you know three four months before that it was like once a year so I'm not very Facebook friendly yet yet hopefully it probably won't be but I'll do a little bit anyhow but on there was an ad that said this whatever nonprofit we're helping to save sharks because we want to keep sharks in the world and I was thinking about that myself and I'm like but human babies, we can throw them out at the heartbeat, can't we? The creature rather than the creator. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. Huh, we're right at the start of good old Pride Month, right? 
And uh, it's very hard to not, not see it, isn't it, you know? As it's everywhere around us. It, it's a perfect example, though, that this is 2,000 years later, folks. But this is the Apostle Paul talking in 30, 40, 50, 60 AD. Same thing going on, just a different day. Man has been doing this for thousands of years. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, or excuse me, I'm going back, sorry. Did I get that right? That's right. All right, that's right. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. So this is the beginning state of all believers without God. A foreigner to the scriptures, to the covenants of promise, to the Torah, to the temple service of God, to the adoption or sonship, to the glory of Jehovah. Just as verses 1 through 5 said, these are the blessings that the children of Israel had. Unregenerate pagans, Gentiles, did not have those. Yet, in Jehovah's grace and mercy, he planned before the foundation of the earth to bring all nations, all people to him through the witness of his son. That was a pretty amazing today. I don't know if, I, if you would think back, the songs and, and the Torah portion and everything, there's a connection there that happened. Like we keep saying, it was crazy because my wife didn't know anything about what I was teaching about. And obviously the herds had no idea what I was teaching about. And I just asked Brenda, I said, here's the Torah portion, pick something out of it. And God interweaves these things together to like emphasize the point. Jehovah in his grace and mercy planned before the foundation of the earth to bring all nations, all people to him through the witness of his son. He planned to bring Abraham and his children in first. Israel would become a great nation. Its branches would fill the earth. Then through Abraham's seed, all other nations would call upon the name of Yeshua as their Messiah and Master, their Christ and Lord. No longer would they be foreigners to the covenants of promise, the adoption of sons, the Torah and its righteousness, the glory of the one true God in the universe. So by faith, by trusting, they would attain righteousness. They would attain citizenship in the commonwealth, the state, the community of Israel. They would now be part of the ecclesia, the called out assembly of Jehovah. They would now be taught and understand the reality of being the people of God. They would seek to live according to Jehovah's commands. To walk in the way of the master. To take up their cross and follow him. To have the willingness to leave everything behind in order to obey his commands. Whether that be your father your mother, your brother, your sister. Discipleship of the master means choosing Yah's ways no matter what and trusting that he will see us through. So you can see when I put things in that direction that this whole thing, this whole question that is being asked by these believers is a huge and very valid question. Because did not our Messiah say, leave all these things, follow me? Right? And if it is not valid that is, this is what I can trust, then why would I leave all these things to follow you?
by faith, by trusting, they would attain righteousness. But as we look at this whole gambit of the teachings of the scripture, as these apostles would go and reach into these communities of pagan Gentiles and reach new believers for the Messiah and begin to train them, the core of what would be taught, as Acts 15 tells us, are the books of Moses. Each and every week, those things would be taught how to live, how to not be like a Gentile, and how to instead be like a child of Israel. They must learn to obey his commands. Now, throughout my life, there's, there's a couple things that people have taught. Number one, there's 613 commands that are in the Torah. That's, that's a nice number, but not really valid. You know, it's one of those things where I can pick and choose and make it a certain number. 613, one guy came up with, that's what it is, one rabbi. It's probably a lot more than that. But even at 613, you have a lot of pastors throughout history who said, no one can do 613 commands. That is completely impossible. Yet how many of us go around and are expected to follow every command of our country, state, community, locality, city, county, and there's a whole lot more than 613? Do, us go, do we go around fretting about it? Going like, I can't do this. No. Or do we just expect it to be done, right? And when we learn about one, we implement it, we go along our way. Sometimes there are penalties when we don't do it, right? Anybody ever had a penalty for a law that they didn't know they were breaking? And, and all of a sudden, oh yeah, yeah, like a septic system. <laughs> Good example there. That Out of the blue, oh by the way, you're breaking law, here's a fine, you know? It happens. How many of us knew all the things we were supposed to do from the Torah when we first learned about the Torah? I know I didn't. And it's taken a process of... How much? I still don't. I, it's taken a process of steadily growing and, and learning and studying and, and, and implementing into my life and into each of your lives. His commands. But the reality is, to be his follower, he desires us to do his commands. So I, made a, I tried to make a pretty good synopsis of the list. And my list only includes 14. That's pretty good, right? So let's see what happens. Do not work or fulfill your desires on his Shabbat. Let our animals, slaves, employees, friends, family, neighbors, enemies also not work. Be holy, for I am holy. Eat only those things that our master calls food, not what the world calls food. Be holy, for I am holy. Obey his ways of keeping yourself clean in an unclean world, whether within relationships, touching things, eating things, healthy living. Be holy, for I am holy. Abstain, run from sexual immorality and inappropriate relationships of all kinds. Be holy, for I am holy. Have a marriage based upon the husband-wife structure of God's word. Be holy, for I am holy. Do not parent according to the world's standards. Do not seek, trust, implement the world's advice on how to raise our children. But bringing up children from infancy in the nurture and admonition of the scriptures. Be holy, for I am holy. Do not charge usury to your brother, but lend graciously. Be holy, for I am holy. Take care of the widows and orphans among you. Be holy, for I am holy. Follow godly ordained leadership. Be holy, for I am holy. Convocate, assemble with other believers on his Shabbats and on his feast days, and do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Be holy, for I am holy. Give of your tithes, your offerings for the service of the body, for feasts, 
for compensating leadership, for taking care of the poor, the widow, and the orphans among you. Be holy, for I am holy. Deal honestly with all, and do not covet what is not yours. Be holy, for I am holy. Do not commit murder, commit abortion, or hate your brother, but hate what is evil. Be holy, for I am holy. Be humble, be content, be happy. Rejoice in Jehovah always. And again, I say rejoice. And be holy, for I am holy. These are troubling and perilous times that we live in, but no more troubling than many other times in history. These believers had chosen to have faith, believe, put their trust in Jehovah. They were choosing to walk by faith and not by sight. To these fellow disciples of Yeshua living in Rome, these brothers of Paul, by faith, living out their newfound faith was getting sticky. Kind of like those, probably those suckers, if you have one, you know, it's all over your hands. Can't get rid of it. The trustworthiness and reliability of Jehovah and the message of the gospel were on the forefront of this congregation and soon all the congregations throughout the world. The Jews in this congregation would soon lose everything as they were forced by edicts of the emperor to leave Rome with nothing. It's very likely that Paul's friends Aquila and Priscilla were kicked out of Rome in this edict and were left trying to go along the way and get some work along the way as tent makers and that's how they met Paul and became fast friends with Paul. They were probably believers from this church in Rome and who knows, maybe they were the ones that actually recarried the, this, this actual letter back to Rome as his friends to give to that congregation when eventually they were allowed back in. But the divisions that were happening by, from the, by the pagans and, uh, from the world, from Jews, from Gentiles, all these things that we um, see happening even today were already happening from Jewish authorities. So, so on one hand, the Jews were already saying, hey, you can't be, if you want to be a good Jew, you cannot hang out with those guys that believe in that Messiah. If you do, we're going to kick you out. So that was one hand. And over here now, we're starting to see the world and the pagan world say, hey, if you relate to the Jews, we're going to kick you out. The ability to trust in Jehovah's word was essential as these believers would soon be choosing between turning from God or facing imprisonment or even death. If Jehovah cannot keep his promise to Israel, then what are we to do? And Paul's unwavering response to this concern was the righteousness you have obtained by faith or trusting in Jehovah is perfect, unfailing, and capable of absolute fulfillment. Next week we will see more completely Paul's response to Jehovah's faithfulness to both Israel and to these new Gentile believers. But I want to close by looking at a few passages of Scripture that will help us focus on our good Heavenly Father's care for us. Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 through 34. Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles, the pagans, seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. I thank God, whom I serve with a pure conscience, as my fathers, forefathers did, as without ceasing I remember you in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring, Timothy, to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. 
Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Master, our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus, Yeshua Messiah, before time began, but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Yeshua Messiah, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, to which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. For this reason, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that what I have committed to him until that day. Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me, and faith and love which are in Yeshua Messiah. That good thing which was committed to you, keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. And lastly, Proverbs 22, verses 4 and 5. By humility and the fear of Jehovah are riches and honor and life. Thorns and snares are in the way of the perverse. He who guards his soul will be far from them. Shabbat Shalom. Would everyone please turn to Lord of the World? We're trying to verify what the page is. I think it might be 46, but... <laughs> 